Welcome to Snack Food for the Soul. Our discussion this week is about giving thanksgiving, sharing our gratitude to the Lord for all that he's done for us faithfully over the course of our lives. I made a recent Facebook post that said, be careful to thank him with the same passion in which you asked him. How many times do you find yourself in your life spending a lot more time begging and pleading and petitioning heaven for something than you do thanking heaven and thanking the Lord for faithfully granting your hopes, your wishes, your prayers, and your desires? You know, we, we as a, a nation, we're a blessed nation, the United States. We're, we've, got, we've had God's favor for practically all of our existence. Up until lately, we're starting to get eaten out by this cancer, the self-loathing thing. And it's going to show itself more as uh, time unfurls history. And uh, we're setting a precedence here. And uh, we will soon, unfortunately, realize that it will become our own undoing. But... When we compare ourselves to our brothers and sisters around the world, we haven't had a lot of natural disasters that would tear apart our fabric to destroy our resolve. When I think of our brothers and sisters in Asia and Africa, they've had earthquakes, mudslides, monsoons, ferry boats turning over and thousands of lives being lost. We've had some pretty devastating hurricanes here in the United States and uh, a lot of loss of life and damage, and it's been horrible. We've lost a lot of brothers and sisters in the Caribbean, and we've had uh, earthquakes in Mexico, scores of lives being lost. But God has been gracious to us as a nation. Sure, everyone suffers the hand of terrorism, but that's that's man but i'm talking in terms of natural disasters god has been pretty good to us and um there is a saying that says that comfort begets weak character and uh kind of harsh when you think about it that's when when you start to lead a life of entitlement where you feel that god and everybody else owes you something because of the good and, and there's nothing necessarily an indictment against our nature. That is what it is. The, the rich kid, the spoiled rich kid, enjoys the richness in life. And uh, we get things from people. And when you have lots of good things and wonderful things and someone gives you another wonderful item, you thank them. Uh, uh, but we don't really think of the value of God's grace in our life until he pulls the grace off until he turns his back. And I think of our brothers and sisters in, in Africa and again in Asia, uh, India, and some of our impoverished nations within these con continents. When you give a child a pair of gently worn shoes, they don't know what to say. When you give a child a roof over their head, clean water, heal them of scurvy and heal them of, of infections, Parents are bent over with gratitude, crying, sobbing at your feet, thank you. And, and when we get a raise in our job, well, amen, two, three percent. Ah, I wish it was five percent. Why could it be 10 percent? You know, when we are, you know, just about arguably one of the wealthiest nations on the planet. We're not the wealthiest anymore, but we're certainly within the top three or four. And so with this idolatrous behavior, there is a precedence. The children of Israel, Jews, God's chosen people. In the Old Testament, it's replete with how they dishonored God and broke covenant and constantly, constantly would thumb their nose at him for delivering them from abject poverty and enslavement. Think of the children of Israel. For about 400 years, they were impoverished and enslaved by Egyptians. And well, forensic archaeologists and, and historians are now presenting proof that it wasn't really 400 years, it was about 239 years. Well, regardless of how long, they were enslaved and they cried out to God to give them a savior. And here comes Moses and, and delivered them by God's hand of grace. And there they were in 40 years in the desert for a journey that would only take 11 days, 250 miles. 
And God gave them a pillar of fire to warm them by night and cloud to keep them cool by day. He fed them. He fed them. Their shoes never wore out. But when Moses ascended the mountain to get the laws by which they should govern themselves, they quickly, quickly erected altars to worship false gods and still cursed their God, cursed Moses. It's rough out here. And then I think of back in the Old Testament through Deuteronomy and Exodus and Judges particularly, whenever God delivered them from seven battles, I remember seven wars, seven victories, they would erect an altar to worship seven false gods. God gave them about 40 years of total peace so they can reconcile themselves with him and they didn't, they forfeited that. And then he would turn them over to 40 or 50 years of of pain and suffering so they can learn a lesson, no lesson learned. And when he would give them deliverers and prophets, they wouldn't listen. And so it's one thing when you turn your back on God and then he turns his back on you. So you give him up and then he gives you up, but nothing is worse than when he gives you over to. When he gives you over to your desires, Oh, my friend, that's a whole different punishment. When a, a child throws a temper tantrum in a shopping mall, you see the parent try and grab the child and pick them up and they throw their hands down and they, they wail and throw down on the ground and roll around and start screaming and hollering. Then, then you see that parent turn and walk away and hide. And then the child looks to the left, looks to the right, looks up and down, and then terror takes over them that's when god turns his back on us for being spoiled little children but then when the parent tells the child don't go play in the parking lot the child throws a tantrum and then not only does the parent give the child up but the parent gives the child over to their desire so then the parent lets the child play in the parking lot and the child sees a car screeching to a halt just before it hits them. And then they empty their bowels into their diaper. And now you've got a different child. But when that child then sees you and runs into your arms and screams and hollers and, oh, I'm so scared. And then, then, then five minutes later, they're throwing another temper tantrum. That's a special kind of child. Oh, and I can hear what you're saying to yourself. Oh, that ain't gonna be my child. <laughs> but we have become those kind of children to God because we have this temporal <sighs> mindset for thanksgiving, but an eternal mindset for requesting and asking. And when we become that weak character, when we become that child that lives that mindset of entitlement, that rich child, that child that that just wants constantly. What, what is that? That's idolatrous behavior. And the children of Israel did that constantly. They broke all the Mosaic laws. They couldn't honor the festivals, couldn't honor the feasts. They wouldn't forgive, wouldn't love. That's what was missing. And when Jesus came in the New Testament and brought about grace, they say he broke Mosaic law. No, he fulfilled the law because what was missing was the love and the forgiveness of and the treatment of brothers to brothers. And so he seemingly broke all the laws and came to the dispensation of grace and was so grateful because in the dispensation of grace, he became the ultimate emancipator, the ultimate civil rights leader. He didn't just come for the rich and the poor, the Sadducees and the Pharisees. He came for the leper and the healed, the man, the woman, the child, the grown up. He came for the rich, the poor. Yes, he came for the gay, the lesbian, those strung out on drugs and alcohol. He came for everyone. He leveled the playing field so all have a right to the throne of life. I am the way, the truth, and the life. Not the priest anymore, not the prophet anymore. I am the way, the truth, and the life. He was the ultimate emancipator. The sun rises and sets on the just and the unjust. And so where are we, beloved? 
we ask him for days and weeks, we fast and we pray, become very religious. We can quote scriptures more than our social security number when we want him to deliver us from the bill collector. Oh, the mortgage, the foreclosure, the bankruptcy. Oh, the surgical procedure I'm going to have done. Oh, Lord God, I know because we're out of control then, you see. We don't know how the anesthesia is going to treat us. We don't know how the, well, the doctor says only, I've only got a 33% chance of full recovery. So then let me beg him and, and let me give him 100% of my prayer. And, and my child, oh, Lord, bring them back from the military. And, oh, rescue my child from the streets. Deliver them from the abusing of drugs and alcohol. Oh, Lord, deliver me from this bad marriage, this abusing spouse. Oh, help my son and daughter in that marriage. Help them with this custody battle. Help them with the IRS. Help, 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 help. Oh, yes. Oh, I got a mindset of praise and worship. But then, then we get delivered. And then what happens is we high five the Holy Ghost and keep walking and we worship the gift and forget about the giver. We worship the created and forget about the creator. We worship the blessing and forget about the blesser. And, and we owe oh, because we've become entitled, entitled to the thing uh, and not he. Whatever happened to Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end? Huh? And sometimes, beloved, when we go through, is it because God has turned us over to? Is it that he's turned his back from us? Or is it that he just needs a better show of character from us? So maybe the next time we go through a storm, before we start to shave our head and roll around in sackcloth and ashes, <laughs> maybe we don't need a miracle, we need a memory. Maybe we need to turn back and look from whence he's brought us and look way, way back. I'm talking five years ago, look in the back seat, look in the cargo area, look in the gas tank, look in the mail when you got that check, check your voicemail when you got hired, when you should have gotten fired. Um, look back sometimes before we look forward. Because if the children of Israel looked back to that sea, looked back to the plagues, looked back and looked up and looked around, they wouldn't murmur, but their character was weak because of their comfort. So how many times can you look back in your life and say to yourself, I could have thanked them a little bit more. I could have praised them a little bit longer. And that's why in my heart, my Holy Spirit tells me that the next revival that's gonna come in our nation is gonna come in the hands of the Hispanic church. Oh yeah, white folks had their time. Black folks, we had our time. The Hispanic church, their time is coming because you ever walked into a worship and praise service of a Hispanic church? They'll spend three hours just worship and praise and they don't care. They'll get all sweaty here, all messed up clothes all over the place. They don't care because they just want his presence. Azusa Street, when William Seymour, a black man, ushered in the revival of the Holy Ghost into this nation. Oh, it was all the thing to talk about. And... Europeans had this country for how long? So I say to you, beloved, before we start to get our underwear too tightly drawn <laughs> and start to get too impressed with our walk, let's start to think, wait a minute now, am I slowly turning into the problem when I thought I was the solution? Mm, am I so quick to judge? Rather than thanking him for how he delivered me from the seat right next to that person. And, and how is it that I thank God that, that my truth has not become public knowledge. So then therefore I shouldn't try to tear someone else down with lies. Because if they expose my truth, you know, secret sin, you know, idolatrous behavior, uh, pornography. Uh, 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 it's known through research that the biggest downloads of pornography are in the Bible Belt. And that those who are the biggest opioid users and addictions are in the Bible Belt. So we need to be very careful, church, that we haven't, that we should hope that the Lord holds back his return because half of us wouldn't be going. Don't miss heaven on a technicality. Make sure that you spend as much time thanking him as you do praising him for the request. Make your request known unto the Lord through supplication and prayer. We know the scriptures. 
But sometimes before we make a new request, thank him for your deliverance from that heart attack. Thank him for deliverance from cancer. Thank him for the deliverance from drugs. And, and thank him for deliverance for when you stepped out to do that secret sin that no one was looking. He was looking, but the enemy was looking too and wanted to send you into an accident. So you'd be in an accident in a neighborhood you weren't supposed to be in. That you could be caught in an act with that person that you shouldn't have been in. You would have been exposed. Thank God for deliverance for when you didn't even ask him for that favor, but he delivered you then too. But how many times did you thank him instead of just saying, thank God I wasn't caught? So before we need to go forward and ask him for something else and blow it by not thanking him, Let's go back and thank him for the years ago when we didn't have. Go back and just, just have a hissy thank God fit for deliverance from drugs, for deliverance from secret sin, deliverance out of that bad marriage, for delivering your child, delivering that relative, bringing you out of that surgical procedure, delivering you from that ailment. Oh, dear Lord, how many times do we take a day just for Thanksgiving? How many times have you fasted just to say thank you, not to say I want? Take a fast day to just thank him. Oh, beloved, how do we treat and abuse this God that we got? We live in a home with people and we love them and we see them and pass them in a the hallway. We roll over and kiss them. We sit at the dinner table. We watch a TV show with them, look across the room and say, that was funny. But we've got a God that does not hear our voice all day long. Just what we want. Treat him like a request line. Back in the days when you'd call up a radio station and say, I'd like to hear. Well, Lord, I want this. I want to see more of this. Oh, shut your mouth. Be at peace with the fact that he doesn't turn your truth into the headlines for everybody to see. Thank him for that. Thank him for the fact that you are not what your mommy and your daddy used to be. Thank him for not making your kids what you used to be as a kid. Thank him, thank him, thank him. Take a day just to thank him. During the hurricane, many people lost power. There were heat, there were heat stroke. <laughs> they felt like they were going through heat strokes. And, and I get it, I get it. We understand that, but sometimes we got to say we're without power. But Lord, instead of cursing the darkness, can I light a candle? Eleanor Roosevelt said, rather than curse the darkness, light a candle. In abject darkness, complete darkness, a candle can be seen for miles. What is your light saying? Let your light shine before men and glorify your Father. What is your light saying? Or are you cursing the fact that you've only got a 25 watt bulb, but your situation requires 350 watts? Well, maybe God is dimming you because you've become a dimwit in your praise and your thanksgiving. Bible says I'll enter his courts with thanksgiving. Well, where's your thanksgiving? So as we think and we reflect this week, beloved, be as passionate in your thanksgiving. Don't become a harlot. Don't treat him like he's your pimp. Hmm? Don't become addicted to idolatry and worshiping so much the created and you forgot all about the creator. You get my point. And for those who are dealing with depression and anxiety, you didn't take your life yet, did you? Those who are dealing with suicide, you didn't achieve it yet, did you? Thank him. Thank him. And in the midst of your thanks, he may see it fit to deliver you from that which you haven't asked him for yet. Because he knows your questions. He knows the answers before you re realize there's a question. He sees the end back to the beginning. He's the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. He's omnisapient. He's all powerful, he's omniscient, he's a very intelligent God. And he's all powerful, he's omnipotent. And he's omnipresent. So my beloved, this day choose whom you will serve. Will you be an idol worshiper? Or you will choose to serve your God? My prayer for you, beloved, is that the God of our salvation reminds you of who he is that he puts you back in your place, but just to serve life at his pleasure. He's not to serve you, we're to serve him. Let's remember that. 
And with that, he gives you the courage and the understanding and the wisdom, knowledge, and understanding to follow suit in all that he tells you to do in your life. Beloved, the Lord loves you so much and there's nothing you can do about it. I love you and I trust and pray that you have an indescribably blessed week.